Welcome to the Comic Book Jerk Show podcast. I'm hit, I'm sitting here with Elliot Serrano, the Chicago's king of geeks is what they call you nowadays. Have you noticed that? Yeah, it's like um, I didn't ask for that title. It was given to me. I, I think for a while I was calling myself uh, Chicago's top geek just because it was like it was a branding thing. And I thought mm -hmm. if, if someone complains about it, I'll stop. Although it's funny, I was calling myself Chicago's top geek, and no one, no one like, kind of, no one argued it. And then they, I was like, well, if you want to be the top geek, then just come up and take take the title from me, which <laughs> which no one ever did. And then I had a friend of mine; he works for the sports radio station here in Chicago, like the the number one rated sports radio station in Chicago. And he had me on his show a couple times, and then he dubbed me the king of geeks. I was like, okay. I mean, I believe in democracy, but if this is gonna, yeah. this is gonna be, you know, like a parliamentary sort of thing, I guess I can live with that. So it's stuck that's, ever since. That's awesome. So we got a great show for you guys tonight. So we're gonna kick that music and roll on into it. From the flamers and noobs who were trolling the fans, the midichlorian masterminds concocted a plan before he had an emporium of Endorian L's, and he was complaining about those movie star Christian Bell, and his manga mastermind returned again to reboot his new show with all his geeky friends. Like the difference in Wookiees and Tribbles and Kibbles and Bits, the story comes together like a reductor twist from Harry Potter, or maybe it's worse, you might even curse the jerk for reminding you that everything's worse. In the back of your mind, he says what you never could, and you never should, and you never would, but he could. So listen up, troll, and let's go. It's time to sit back and watch a comic book jerk show. So, Elliot, I noticed it, that the first time I'd ever met you, I had no idea that you you wrote comic books. Like, I had no idea. The way that I recognized you that faithful day of the uh, Avengers screening was I seen you on a YouTube clip uh, interviewing people for C2E2. Now, originally, I, I wasn't even prepared to, to go to C2E2. Like, it was one of those things where, hey, I've got... You know, I live like 10 hours away from Chicago, and uh, I managed to get these these free tickets to see a, a screening for it. So I was like, I'm going to go. So on our way there, I was just researching. I seen that C2E2 was happening the same time that the Avengers was releasing. So I was like, why not check out C2E2? And the first videos that I looked for on YouTube, you was the first person to pop up just interviewing people in cosplay and stuff like that. I was like, I was like, it'd be cool to meet that dude. <laughs> Get up there, and I'm like, I'm I'm standing in the parking lot. I'm like, dude, there's Elliot Serrano. He's like, my my buddy with me was like, who? I was like, that dude's awesome, man. I'm gonna go up there and hand him a butt. <laughs> so that's when it all started. You and in, you invited me to uh, the the dynamite panel, I believe. Yeah, you, dynamite yeah, concert. you and your buddy were in that front row. I remember that. It feels like uh, it feels like we kind of took over the panel from you guys because we asked one question and it was like. Half the panel was revolved around what was the worst comic book movie. <laughs> it stumped everybody. Everybody was like, "Ah!" Oh. But it was it was so much better than what Val Kilmer told us that night. Val Kilmer got so distraught about us asking him what he thought the worst comic book movie was. He was just he was like, "Ah, oh, man, I don't want to be mean to anybody." We asked him to do the uh, "I'm Batman," and he kind of gave us the death glare, like, "I'm not going to do it," you know. <laughs> about about ten, fifteen minutes into uh, his panel, dude, he's he just randomly blurts out, "I'm Batman," and everybody erupts. <laughs> well, he never actually says that in the movies, though. It's funny. Yeah, I know. He gave us that look, like that wasn't me. That was Michael Keaton, and you know, I was looking at my friend. I was like, "That's a dumb question." I asked the guy that was in Top Gun. <laughs> <laughs> I would have said. Uh, yeah, I would have said, you know, do like I'm Iceman or or something like that. Yeah. Or you're dangerous. You're gonna get somebody killed. You know, something like that. Yeah, my my buddy got to ask him the question, and then the rest of the time, every time I held my hand up, he would he would purposely look away, like I'm not asking them jerks another question. <laughs> <laughs> well, that happens. But it seems like like you just become like a phenomenon over at C2E2. It's like you're the go-to guy when they want somebody to do something. Now it's like, hey, we need you to moderate a panel with Stan Lee. Like, that's got to be insane. Like, what did you feel like during that time? Well, it's, it was kind of interesting because when they when they asked me to do it, this was um, last year, the were finding, you know, different panelists and, and moderators and hosts. And um, every year, C2E2 will ask me which ones I want to do because – um, uh, Red Eye, the Chicago Red Eye, is one of the one of the sponsors of C2E2. Mm -hmm. So, because I I freelance for Red Eye and I do a lot of the comic book stuff, um, they said, "Oh yeah, let's ask Elliot. Elliot knows a lot of these things." 
It's weird because um, I remember getting the email. They, they they had asked me to do like the Game of Thrones panel and something else. Mm-hmm. I forget what – there's a couple things they asked me to do. And it was like a sort of a, a, ma- a last-minute bit. They, they go, hey, Elliot, we wanted to know if you'd be interested in moderating Stan Lee's panel – and I'm like, huh? And then, and then, what killed me? What what <laughs> kills me is the next, the, the line that comes after. And if you don't want to, do you know anybody who would? <laughs> what? <laughs> and I was like, what the what? <laughs> You're. I bet you thought it was some kind of prank. I know. Are you, you punching? Did you have to reread the email? Yeah. Like, what's going on here? So they, they, like, I remember seeing those pictures, dude, and I was proud of you, man, because I, you know, after after first meeting you at at the Avengers premiere, dude, I was like. I'm gonna follow this man's work, man. I probably picked up everything that I could find that that you wrote digitally. I was like, I gotta have this on, and I gotta have this, and I gotta have this. And I was I was fascinated by how I watched Evil Dead, like the remake, and it was like a female Ash, and I was like, Alex Ron already did this. He already did that. <laughs> I was thinking if any, anybody deserves some credit for a female type Ash, it's you, man. Cause like, like I'm I'm even the dude that that come up with the petition and to get them to contact you, say, let him write some of Ash versus the Evil Dead or something, you know? Oh, that would have been awesome. But, you know, the, I, I can't take credit for that. Um, the idea of the female Ash uh, actually came from my publisher, uh, Nick Verucci, who wanted to, you know, Nick's very into um, into pushing for the, the new, into new markets. And really, yeah. and the, of course, the big market is female readers. So for the longest time, people have really been getting into female heroines. So they'd already had this um, idea of alternate universes within the Army of Darkness and Evil Dead, you know, uh, stories. And he said, hey, why don't we do, you know, find a, um, a female Ash. Let's come up with a Lady Ash. He also wanted us to come up with the uh, dynamite equivalent of Deadpool. Yeah. So that's where uh, the character of Deadbug comes from. Um, although we never come out and call him Deadbug, he's <laughs> um, he's um, the alien character that the um, Lady Ash meets, or you know, we meet in the first uh, issue of my run on Army of Darkness, and that that was supposed to be kind of like introducing that character, and then he would appear in other, you know, other series from time to time. Also, we wanted to bring back, um, I proposed bringing back the Lady Ash character too, uh, but instead of calling it Army of Darkness or Lady Ash, we'd call it Daughter of Darkness, and um, we just follow Ashley Williams through, you know, her adventures in wherever she is. So um, that's something that's still on the table. From time to time, it's talked about, but, you know, the the Army of Darkness and Evil Dead uh, license itself is always in motion. There are always things going on with that. Now Ash is in space, which is which is kind of interesting. So is he is he going to fight Jason X? You know, it's it's funny because they've been wanting to. We've been trying to figure out other crossovers to do with um, Ash. I figured out a way to do Ash versus the Terminator. Oh. And um, I pitched it, and my editor, when, when, when I did it, he said, you know, that's a really clever way of doing it. And I worked it into the Ash Saves Obama miniseries. So I thought, I might never get to write Ash again, so I'm going to do Ash versus the Terminator <laughs> here. And we're talking, it went to script. It went to script. And my editor even approved it. And when it got to the point where the the artist actually had to sit down and start drawing everything, the licensor at the last moment said, you can't do that. Oh. And I was like, I knew there was going to be yeah. something like I that. Go, you can't do that. I go, what do you mean? I mean, you, the script has been in for how long? You guys read it. You signed off on it. Now when, you know, when Ariel's going to sit down and actually draw Ash fighting the Terminator, you're going to tell him, no, he can't do it? I was like, oh. So then, if you read um, if you read the Ash Shaves Obama mini series, in the second issue where Ash fights these robots, that was supposed to be the Terminator. Oh, see now that is a huge, huge yeah. difference. It's like we went from from Terminator to Obama. Like I thought it was a really, really funny, interesting 
take on it. I was like, I never thought these two would cross over together because that's one of those things. Like, who owns the licensing to use Barack Obama? Like, how could you just throw out the president in anything? Like, I know IDW did a did a run about Obama and everything else. Like, I don't know how they get their licenses rights, but they're always doing something like unofficial Justin Bieber biography or something. Like, they're always doing something silly like that. But I'm really good friends with Brian Rosenthal, who did the uh, Marvel Zombies versus uh, Army of Darkness. And like, the first thing I said to him whenever I seen that, I was like, "Dude, we gotta we gotta send this to Elliot, man." <laughs> like, I figured you would have a geek fest with like, you was the top name on my list. Like, I was like, "Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna send this to him." What'd you think of that? You talk about the short film, right? Yeah, yeah, the short film. I thought it was pretty good. Um, I thought. The whole well, they they did a nice bit of um, capturing the the tone of the Sam Raimi films, but also the dude who played Ash was was pretty pretty dead on. I've seen um, lots of folks do Ash. I went to the Evil Dead musical um, when it came to Chicago and saw the the actor who plays Ash in that, and um. You know, uh, your your you know, the, 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 your guy was a bit better, a bit better. Uh, I gotta say that. Yeah, I know. Um, I know Brian was ecstatic whenever I was like, "Dude, uh, Elliot pretty much gave you some good words on it, man." And he he felt like that was the stamp of approval. Like, you know, for for somebody that's actually wrote stories, you know, about Ash, and then to have somebody that actually told those stories saying your story's pretty great i like it you know that that meant a lot i'm pretty impressed by his his sequel is uh gonna be versus the dc dead which i'm really interested in seeing that like they're start shooting that in in june i think so be um versus the darkest night well it's not going to be darkest night because he figured that there'd be too much uh room to cover but i think it's going to be more like a marvel versus DC zombies type thing. Uh, like he's gonna do his own little spin on it. Or black, so blackest that's, night. That's right. Yeah, yeah, blackest night and then that would brightest. Be, that day. would be pretty awesome though. The blackest night zombies versus the Marvel zombies. Oh man, that that would be something incredible. Because the blackest night zombies, it was impossible to kill those dudes. They you blow them up and they just reform themselves back together. Mm-hmm. To, like it was pretty epic. Oh. But yeah, how long have you you been a Chicago resident? Were you born and raised in Chicago, or was it one of those things where you're like, I'm gonna take off and move to Chicago? No, I'm, I'm born born here. Uh, the my whole family's been here pretty much my whole life. I was born in Cook County Hospital. I was the only member of uh, the only one of my siblings who was born in a public hospital. After me, my mom decided to have all my siblings in private hospitals. <laughs> so, so I go, wow, I, you can't get any more Chicago than that. Because I look at uh, that show ER and I go, yep, that's where I was born. Yep, that's yep, me. That's me. Uh, born in Cook County Hospital, uh, lived b- between the north and the south side from time to time. My family would move back and forth. Um, I'm a Cubs fan, um, sh- Chicago Blackhawks fan, uh, Chicago Bulls fan. Uh, you know, pretty. I even like. I even love the, the Chicago Fire. I'm in the in the in the soccer or what it should be called football. Um, yeah, you know, and yeah, been here my whole life. Uh, I've I've had conversations from time to time. People will ask me, "Hey, do you ever want to leave Chicago? Would you ever move to another city?" And I'm like, I don't know, because Chicago is so used to it. Yeah, it's so it's, used it's to it. Home. But there's so many things here. It would be hard for me to live without a lot of the stuff that I've got here. And um, you'd have to, you'd have to make me a really good deal to to up and move. I noticed ever since I left Chicago, I was like, this is the place I need to be. Like. It was a different culture there than it is where I live. Like where I live, everything is just you got to go through mountains and mountains to get to your destination, and trees and trees, and like there's never any huge buildings. And pretty much the closest city that we have is to me is Lexington, Kentucky, and it's really it's nothing compared to Chicago. Like Chicago, it it feels like you're on a a Batman set when you're in Chicago. Like you know the under underneath of the uh, subways and all that stuff or the trains or whatever like the bridges and stuff that you're yep. you're under uh, that's why they filmed that's how, why they filmed the dark night here um i drive i drive down lower wacker all the time that's where batman had that big car chase and on the bat pod the batmobile and um when i walk to the union station um that i walk down the very street where the joker uh flipped that uh, tr- uh that a uh, truck over to face off against batman 
and the my office uh, right the one street behind where my office is is the street where Bruce Wayne crashed his Lamborghini to save that guy <laughs> who was going to um, out him on television. Like, were you ever present for any of the behind the scenes? Like, did you get to see it from, like, your office or anything? Nah, like, every, that, every time that stuff was going on, I was busy working, and all my friends would be telling me, oh, man, we saw this over here, and oh, man, they're doing that over there. And I remember when uh, Transformers was in town, too. Uh, same thing happened. I would be walking to the office, and I'd see, you know, the the film production studio would have all these empty lots filled with all the um, – the props that they'd be moving out, like to simulate destruction, or you'd find the trucks that were supposed to be Optimus Prime and the others, and like it's like I'm in the middle of a friggin' Transformers movie right now, so yeah, everybody'd be looking for your cameo now. Be like, yeah, you remember that time Elliot was walking to his office? There's there's a scene with him in it. If you freeze frame it and zoom it in by two hundred percent, you'll see. Him. Oh no, because Michael Bay heard about it and then he had to be digitally removed. So oh man, he will I, do that. I got, a, I got a story for you. I did a review uh, where I pretty much complained about Shia LaBeouf kind of ruining Indiana Jones and everything. <laughs> and and it freaked me out when I showed up at C2E2 and he was sitting at this booth and, and I walked past and like I had all my comic book jerk gear on and he gave me this look like I seen your review. <laughs> I was scared. I was like, man, he wasn't even supposed to be here. He just surprised everybody. Yeah, he just, just put sitting there. sell his comic. I remember that. Yeah, yeah that that was a freaky experience for me because I I looked at my buddy and I said, dude, he's he's out to get me. He knew we was coming. <laughs> well, Shia LaBeouf is everywhere. He's I'm the present. He knows. He's just at yeah. the right time. Now you're you're a huge Indiana Jones fan, from what it looks like. Oh. I've I've seen I've, I think I've seen you cosplay Indiana Jones more than in anybody on Facebook. Well, the thing is, my 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 costume is not screen accurate. I mean, it is like the loosest of cosplay, and um, uh, I think the last time I wore my indie gear, it was uh, two Halloweens ago, and um, I was even a sh- I I put it up I put a picture of it on my Instagram. I said, guys, I know this isn't even screen accurate, and I'm ashamed. In the public, but did not. And all my friends were going, no, it's really? good enough, it's good enough. And, and every, everyone who saw me, they recognized me, so I guess, you know, it wasn't too bad, but I'm kind of a, I'm very particular about that kind of thing. All I know is that when I see somebody else dressed as Indiana Jones, I, I can always spot the flaws in the costume. Now, are you, are you kind of like one of those persons? I mean, I'm one of those people that, that whenever I see a, a comic book movie, I want the suit to be screen accurate, or at least something close to that character. But there's some some things like the entire Daredevil series on Netflix. I kept thinking, put on the suit. Just just go ahead and give us two episodes with the suit. We got ten minutes of it, kind of like uh, I don't know if you ever seen the last ten minutes of Smallville, but it kind of felt like that moment for me, you know. Except I didn't have to spend ten years waiting on it. I just had to spend like half a day. But I, I waited for that costume like the whole time, and you know I've been wanting to get people's opinions on it. What did you think of it, like the Daredevil suit? Oh, the final suit, yeah, it looked pretty cool. I mean, we'll see how long it stays that way. You know, every time they create a costume, it evolves, and they'll they'll change it over time. Um, I just, you know, as far as how he was dressed throughout most of the series, and I've made I've made this commentary elsewhere, but I just could not get it out of my head. He looked like the Dread Pirate Roberts. You know? <laughs> I remember you saying you know, that. He just looked like it, and I'm like, and and I know that's the way he looked in the comic book. But I'm look. I'm like, oh man, please, is he getting out of his getup? Or tell me he's going to change into something else because he just it yeah. just looks so ridiculous. Put on a yellow suit. Yeah, and look, look more entertaining. Yeah, even yeah, even the yellow suit. Show me something else or do something else. Well, see, that's that's something that that aggravated me even with the old Incredible Hulk uh, Daredevil film that they did back in the day. That really bothered me. I was like, man, it would have been cool if comic book characters were actually, you know, I would have enjoyed seeing Spandex Spider-Man in there, you know, from the, I think it was the 76 Spider-Man. Mm-hmm. Did you ever see that series? Oh, yeah, no, I remember that. The, the, that was the one where um, Peter Part, where Spider-Man's web shooters mm-hmm. were on the outside. There were these big silver boxes wrapped around his, <laughs> um, his uh, wrists. And when he shot his webs, it was, like, ridiculous. You know, the, they didn't quite get the effect down. Um and and he rarely there was did never, it. Yeah, never any iconic villains in it either. It was like never anyone. No, no, because they 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 couldn't figure out a way to make it convincing on in live television. See, the thing about comic books is that you know there's stuff that works in a comic 
that just doesn't work in live action. Just like, you know, why certain things just translate better in the animated series than they do in the live action. Um, you look at the destruction, a lot of folks say, you look at the destruction that took place in uh, Man of Steel. You know, yeah. that was friggin' like 9-11 times a dozen, right? Um, mm-hmm. But... Uh, it, but if you do that same thing, like let's say the Superman animated series, it just doesn't seem as bad. Cer- certain things just translate better yeah, you know, one way or another, and, and some I, don't. I mean, I always watch those cartoons, and I always thought, golly, how many buildings are blown up, and how many times did they actually check to make sure no one was in those buildings? That you know, just to throw out a quick spoiler for Avengers, that was something that kind of made me pretty pretty excited just to see a superhero actually scan the building before you know he throws the hulk down there you know? <laughs> yeah i know like that was one of those things it's like why didn't superman do this he's got all these super visions and you know he's got super speed but i mean in man of steel i didn't really see that he had super speed like that was one of those small things that i didn't really see super speed unless they were throwing punches and it was like super quick which there was a lot of parts of, of man of steel that just I don't know. They just irk me as a as a fan of of Superman, but really, essentially, it's still better than Superman Returns. Although, you know, that was one of those mo- movies that more or less bores you to death. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I really had very high expectations for Superman Returns. I thought, you know, Brian Singer's a really good director. The problem with that is that they just gave him too much leeway and let him do whatever he wanted, and ugh, you know, kind of he kind of killed it. So. I couldn't have imagined Superman uh, lives ever going into production. That just would have been a really strange take because you know how kooky Burton is, anyways. Yeah, he, yeah. He wanted to make that. He he wanted to make what kind of Man of Steel is that sci-fi crazy. I don't know what to explain there. Well, Superman really does work pretty well as science fiction. I did I did crack up though when um there's that there was that big. Uh, uh, you know, row over um, Peters. I'm trying to remember the the, direct, the producer's first name. Um, wanting Superman's Fortress of Solitude to have polar bears, and they were like, <laughs> "Oh my God, how can you? Oh, what is wrong? This guy doesn't get it. You know, polar uh, bears. How, how are they going to be polar bears around Superman's Fortress of Solitude? This is so stupid. Blah 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 blah." Then you watch Man of Steel. What's outside of Fortress of Solitude? Polar bears. Yeah, there was polar bears. There were bears. polar bears there. I'm like, and no one said anything about that. So I like how they talked about the giant spiders, and then we get the Superman Doomsday animated film. We get a giant spider. That really irked me. Like, <laughs> Superman Doomsday was the worst animated one that they've put out, man. And I'll even, I'll even, I'll even put up any of them that anybody says just sucked for DC's animated. But I mean, to be a fan like I was, like, I adored the Death of Superman saga. Like, I thought it was epic. Like, I thought, you know, this is a new change of events. Superboy looks badass. He's not just wearing a black T-shirt saying, hey, I'm Superboy. Don't call me Superboy. I'm Superman. You know, <laughs> I don't remember if you remember much of that saga, but uh, it's just one of those things. It's like, you know, you can't you can't just go in there and give us a, what was it, a 60-minute film or 70-minute film? I haven't. It just, I haven't seen it. So I mean, you haven't seen no. Superman Doomsday. Nope. You're lucky. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's some there's some things I wanted to ask you about that. I never hear you talking about any of the animated movies or anything. Like when I read uh, read stuff about you or read reviews or listen to podcasts, you you never really seem to bring up much of the animated stuff. So is there like a reason you don't get into some of the animated stuff rather than? You know, well, like the TV shows. And- well, for the most part, my, my rule is this. You know, if I like it, I'll talk about it. If I don't like it, I won't talk about it. So, so what, do you, what do you like as far as the animated, like Marvel or DC? Uh, not crazy. I mean, it's funny. It's the, the reverse for Marvel. I'm not crazy about the animated stuff on the Marvel side. Really enjoy the live action stuff, the movies and TV series. Uh, for DC, not crazy about the live action stuff, and um, their animated stuff is usually is pretty good. I think the last one that I really enjoyed was All Star Superman, because uh, I really liked that um, um, the the series that Grant Morrison and Frank Quietly did together. The um, the movie that was made of it was was um, done quite quite well, 
it seemed pretty mm-hmm. much scene by scene, though. There's the minor stuff taken out of it, but nothing really noticeable. Yeah, because it's like 12 issues, so you, you know, if you want to do the whole thing, it would t- it would have taken you a couple hours. So yeah. compress it down into just one, um, like a was it a, was like a yeah like a 75 minute movie. Yeah. Um, you'd have to take out some stuff, but it was the and that ending is such a great ending. So um, that 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 one is you know it seems like they have really have a nice handle on doing the animated stuff. Mm-hmm. Again, they can translate a lot of stuff into animated. Although n- there's no real cohesion to the animated universe, it, nothing feels like if I see a story in this movie, it doesn't feel like it overlaps with the story in another movie yeah. or another. They just seem like a whole bunch of standalones that aren't related to each other. Yeah. And so, eh. but but uh, for for what they're what they are, what they're worth, um, they're they're more they're way more entertaining than the live action stuff DC's doing. Well, I noticed that that I think Kevin Smith said something about it not too long ago about how you know he he suggested that you've got all these great comic book writers, but yet you know Warner Brothers is you know when people say something negative about DC movies, the first thing that comes to mind is Warner Brothers. It's like. If they would actually get writers that wrote the comic books and actually worked close with them instead of saying, hey, we need a big Hollywood writer to come in here and kind of, you know, muck up stuff and kind of twist and turn it. Like, we could have got a great Green Lantern movie if if they would have just hired some actual comic writers and said, hey, we want all the comic artists to, to write stories. And I think that's something different that, that the DC animated features do that, that Warner Brothers doesn't do. The DC animated features seem to play off the comic books like... Uh, most of the time, they're they're rolling off the graphic novels, so they're throwing the graphic novels in there with actual stories from comic writers. But then you get the movies, and it's just I don't know, it's just something completely different. Like I want to be excited for Suicide Squad, but they just released the whole casting or the whole cast crew picture. I don't know if you've seen this yet. They uh, posted the Suicide Squad cast, and it's kind of like is it a little bit too soon to be posting? you know, pictures of all these people. And it's like you said um, in your last podcast, it's like, um, how are you going to show me all the villains when you haven't even shown me that superheroes do something good, you know? I, you know, with with, uh, with DC, it seems like they're they're trying too soon to start generating buzz when everybody else pretty much has a spotlight right now. They're trying to steal the spotlight, and quite frankly, they haven't earned it yet. You know, the, it's not like they've made hit movies that, you know, are just getting all this attention. Uh, Batman versus Superman. Eh, you know, it's it's Zack Snyder yet again um, aping somebody else's source material. I mean, looks like man, um, Dark Knight Returns for the most part. And it, it, it wasn't even, I mean, how many people really loved Watchmen? I mean... You look at uh, that's a good point. You know, Watchmen. Everyone hailed how he did this incredibly wonderful and faithful adaptation of Watchmen, which it was, and he even did that one change at the end, which kind of worked. Uh, the way he yeah, but I, I like what, where he didn't make the magic squid at the end instead. Yeah, which know. he said wouldn't have worked. But I'm like, uh, no, with today's you know. But today's I think it technology would have, would have totally worked. worked. You could have made it work, yeah. But if, uh, at that point, if that is just beyond the budget that you are, you already have. Yeah. So, but I mean, again, great. I mean, the movie was done so well technically that you had studios suing for a portion of the profit. You know, <laughs> studios that had like dropped the thing in production and then say, no, 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 we didn't drop it. We we still own these rights and da 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 da, and trying to get a get a share of what they expected to be a huge hit, and then the thing hits theaters and what happened? <laughs> so it, it 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 didn't catch like everyone thought it did. Now Zack Snyder in in himself is is a good technical film director. His stuff has a feel to it, a look to it. It's really, you know, impressive. Uh, the problem is, is that he just doesn't understand the characters. He doesn't get the characters themselves. He doesn't understand what makes Superman Superman. What I mean, and we'll see if he, get, he understands Batman at all. Because, um, you know, if, if he gives me the goddamn Batman, which was Frank Miller wrote, <laughs> I mean, that's, it's going to turn a lot of people off. 
Yeah, I mean, I I like The Dark Knight Returns, but I'm not in love with it. I know a lot of friends and fans of it that just praise that as the ultimate comic, but to me, it's just one of those, like, I liked it, but then they, they released Strikes again, and that was about the same time I started reading Returns. It's like, I was like, uh, this is just too much, just weirdness. And Yeah, I remember The Dark Knight Strikes and, and going, I have no idea what, what Frank Miller's doing with this. And it's kind of like the the well hath run dry, and now with this whole uh, third chapter, you know, Dark Batman, the 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 Master Race. I'm like, really, really. Um, yeah, that's got to be something to a lot of fanboys. It's like, oh yeah, anything will be better than Strikes Again. That's all the all the trolling that I read on the internet. People saying that over and over. Well, I don't know. I mean, well, he's gonna have Brian Azzarello on it with him, so that should be interesting um i'm just curious as to who the artist is going to be because you think you'd want an artist who can kind of do that style of artwork from the first two maybe i don't know darwin cook who knows you know doing something like that i want to see more alex ross comics man alex ross is just he's one of them dudes that i'm like oh my well, he can do whatever he wants. Duke can like write his own ticket. He's I know he's doing all that DC stuff. He's doing dynamite stuff. Um, he's doing Marvel stuff. He uh, uh, the guy can make more money and has less hassle uh, doing covers than he would be doing interior artwork. So or not not choosing sides. Like he's neither Marvel or DC. Like there's usually those two and then whatever's left. But he seems to be like I'll do anything. Just give me enough money, yeah. pay me enough, give me give me something that interests me, and I'll do it. I mean, I don't I don't blame him. I mean, I, this whole thing, I know, I know that people say it a lot with the fans, it's like Marvel or DC. And I mean, I I always sit, you know, talk about Marvel or DC. I'm not. I mean, yeah, I'm kind of a Marvel fanboy, and I, I take shots at DC from time to time. But it's only because right now, quite frankly, I'm enjoying the Marvel stuff a lot more than the DC stuff. There was a time when I enjoyed the DC stuff a lot more than the Marvel stuff. And there, the pendulum you know, has swung back and forth. Um, it, it's just I don't yeah. get some of the ideas, you know, some of the attitudes that these publishers are having um, with uh, their comics. Right now, both DC and Marvel are doing their damnedest to alienate as many new readers as they can with these friggin' events, you know? That's- yeah, I, I, <clears throat> speaking of, of comics again, uh, did you happen to go to Free Comic Book Day? Do you ever partake in the yearly festivity? Or I do. I, did, work at I would from time to time. I didn't go this year because I had a lot of other stuff going on. I, had a, um, I was still hungover from my buddy's bachelor party. So I <laughs> so. I'm I'm sure somebody picked you up a copy of Doctor Who. Oh, <laughs> three amazing stories. Oh no, I gotta get that. I've gotta get that. Yep, but it's got the three last three Doctors. Oh, story of each. But man, I I don't know if you're familiar with this this new uh, Attack on Titan stuff that seems to be picking up. But it seems like that Attack on Titan seems to be blowing up as one of the animes of the year or something for some reason i picked up a i'm trying to find the copy i think it was secret war zero but uh if you're not familiar with attack on titan um it's basically these big giant titans eating a lot of people and you know it's one of those animes but in secret wars issue zero um it's actually the avengers versus attack on titan so it's called attack on avengers and it's really pretty epic like for for fans of attack on titan or watching this, you know, this anime that people are going crazy about. It's really weird to to see an anime being cross promoted with with the Avengers. I've tried watching Attack on Titan, and it is like one of those things that I just don't get it. You know, is it? It'd probably be one of those things. It would be better if they actually released the English versions, <laughs> so you can watch all the English dubs in one sitting. Because it actually is pretty good if you can get past reading subtitles that's oh, one of the things okay. that drove me nuts i don't mind subtitles Re- myself just you know the the concept of it was kind of like huh what and they have these things that they put around their waist that like help them what like fly or swing or what but how does that help them fight these titans what yeah it's it's a really drawn out series 
I actually watched it all in one sitting one time, and then I was like, I think I can partially speak Japanese now. Ha! <laughs> I think I did that with Shogun. Uh, by the by, the end of Shogun, I was actually I could actually understand Japanese. Yeah, I remember when Cowboy Bebop came out, and it, they didn't have any English versions of it, and I was like, oh, I'm watching this, because it felt like like if they ever make the Cowboy Bebop movie, Keanu Reeves is definitely that dude. Like to me, watching it, I'm like, yeah. I see Keanu Reeves in that. I just can't get past the title. <laughs> and it's, it, Cowboy Bebop. That sounds like a like a like a soda. Well, to me, it feels like uh, it feels like like an anime version of Firefly. I mean, to be honest, like watching all the series run of Firefly and then watching Cowboy Bebop, kind of like say you watch one, then watch the other, then watch you know another episode. It kind of feels like it floats in some kind of continuum like that. So what what character in Cowboy Bebop actually is Cowboy Bebop? Uh, I think he's a cowboy. Is there anyone in there named Cowboy Bebop? I don't think so. It's kind of like uh, the, they always say in, uh, when the Pink Floyd albums, they always ask, okay, which, which mm-hmm. one of the band's pink? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, speaking, of, speaking of bands, dude, what about them... Uh, coming out with uh, a, that oh who was it uh gin and the holograms movie oh yeah yeah <clears throat> i was watching I, that, I just... that cartoon the other day and i was like i was like this this wasn't a bad series but i'm i'm dreading on what they're going to release apparently it's by the same person who did spice world oh no the spice girls <laughs> movie which was i i i not it was pretty good for what it was i'm telling you Everyone watched it, you know, I mean, and it got it got some good reviews for what it was. Okay, remember we're talking about the Spice Girls here, but you know, you sit down, and you watch it. Was it is it a hard day's night? No. no, and even they were saying that in the movie themselves. You know, well, it it was definitely better than Josie and the Pussycats. I never saw Josie and the Pussycats, although oh, I really love that cartoon, man. It's a live animation that really screwed it up for me. And I had uh, such a crush on Josie. As a kid, so who have you wrote for over the years, Ellie? And I noticed you in a on a different page every other month. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's like Elliot's here and he's here and he's here. Yeah, he's a jack of all trades, an expert at none. Uh, as far as comic book work goes, um, all for the most part, it's been Dynamite Entertainment. I've written uh, as far as my um, my other writing stuff, my blogging, comics, waiting room, uh, Chicago Red Eye. Of course, I have Geek to Me now as my own my yeah. my own brand. It's my thing now. Um, oddly enough, my very first um, pitch that I did for comics was a Superman Adventures pitch, which was accepted. Uh, DC was going to buy it. Uh-oh. And I was actually going to write it. My, I was would have broken into comics writing Superman, um, which would have been such a huge thrill. Unfortunately, um, that the, was on the tail end of the title. Joey Cavallari, who was the um, uh, the editor at the time, um, uh, liked the idea, but then the title got c- canceled. And then uh, friggin' Mark Miller got to finish off the run on Superman Adventures. Uh, do you remember what crisis was on the horizon during that time? I, I think they were just they just they were all the the adventures books, whether it was the Batman one or the the Superman one. They were just they were getting canceled. You know, they like the animated, the animated, like based off the animated yeah, based yeah. Off the animated series. I guess they, they thought they weren't getting the right you know the readership, which is to me kind of kind of sad because. That's how you get kids in the reading comics, yeah. you know? They they see the cartoons and you go, Oh, okay, look, this is a comic book that's based on the cartoon. You can read this. Yeah. And um and uh, so I remember uh last year at Free Comic Book Day, like I hated the Teen Titans Go series like so bad. But I got like a free comic book that day and I was reading it and I was like, This isn't too bad. I started watching the series, dude, and it's kinda like watching uh watching mad mad T V skits or something. Like it's not the superheroes that that you want, <laughs> or the ones that Cartoon Des- Network deserves, but <laughs> it's one of it's one of those that's just like, eh, it's fun for your kids, and it's 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 fun for the younger folks that that knew about Mad TV and Mad Magazine. And, it's kind of like that. Yeah, and it's just like it's like you call it the gateway. It's a gateway title. I mean, the one thing that really got me into reading comic books as a kid was a Star Wars comic. 
Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you about. Like, what what really set you off for comics? That the, the the Star Wars comic is probably what made me more of a Star Wars fan than the Star Wars movies. Because yeah. here's the thing, um, I grew up as a from a person of very modest means. My parents, were, you know, we were quite a few kids in my family. We didn't have a whole lot of money. Going to the movies was a treat. We're talking. Exactly. My my dad took us to the movies maybe two or three times a year. We're talking a year because he just didn't have the money to do that, to take us all to the movies. Um, and it had to be something that we all wanted to see. We all wanted to see it. So uh, Star Wars, I saw Star Wars about a month or two after it actually came out. Um, all my friends had already seen it, and by the time I got to see Star Wars, all my friend I had already heard all the quotes. All my friends were like, "Yeah, you know, oh, princess, what a wonderful smell you've discovered!" And you know, it all makes sense now. Yeah, right? Just like, oh wow. So, but as a kid, I read all the Star Wars comics before I even saw the movie. Yeah. So, um, it, I, I I remember that's kind of what got me into to comics too. Is um. Uh, I used to, to go to uh, one of my mom's, uh, let's see, it was my mom's uncle or something, and he had um, the original Star Wars on VHS, like, taped off like a network television show, so it had all the commercials and stuff, and I would sit there and uh, watch those, like, over and over, and he said, I got something else to show you, and, like, he had a big book stand of nothing but, like, Star Wars books, like, he had the the original, like, graphic novels that was in, like, the, uh, the smaller book forms, it was, like, uh, all black and white, like, it was kind of made like a novel but he had like all kinds of those and that's all i would do is sit around and watch watch star wars and try to adjust the tracking on the vcr to try to get it to come in <laughs> oh i remember those days man but star wars is one of those things that can't be taken for granted especially with um may the fourth be with you coming up tomorrow or which they'll probably hear the podcast on that day so happy may the fourth <laughs> and also with you <laughs> But but something I wanted to to ask you: Did you get any like conspiracy theories about the Force Awakens when you went on your your Star Wars celebration? Um, I heard a couple things. I heard a couple things here and there, kind of kind of nutty stuff. Um, and um, you know, I, I I've already said that there are a couple things that if this if it happens in the movie, I don't care when it happens in the movie, I'm walking out. <laughs> I am walking out. Well, tell tell me what that would be, because I've got one for you that would make you probably walk out too. Okay, if that stupid rumor where the movie opens with Luke Skywalker's hand holding the lightsaber is floating through space, if that's the way the movie opens, I'm walking out. What? I'm walking what? out. I'm like, this is. St I'm done. I'm out. That is the silliest I rumor know. I've ever heard. What are they going to do? Just have him like dead and it all be a flashback? No, movie? it's like just uh, uh, the, his hand and the lightsaber have been floating through space oh. since Empire Strikes Back. Well, that's that's a that's that's a fan film right there. Yeah. That's straight up something out of a fan film. Kind of like uh, the guys that did the uh, fake Batman intro where it's playing Zod on the TV and Batman's standing there looking at the screen. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, that would be kind of cool, actually. Um, but here, here's a theory that I got to thinking. You posted a picture of Finn sporting a lightsaber, so I got to th I got to looking back, and I was thinking throughout this trailer he's talking about my family is Jedi and all this stuff, my family this, my family that, and then you showed a picture of Finn with a lightsaber. It made me think since Lando pretty much won the Millennium Falcon in a card game, could Lando have cuckled him out of Princess Leia <laughs> and formed Finn? Like, that's the theory that went through my head. Just by seeing it, I mean, that's how deep invested people get with Star Wars. You see something as small as concept artwork, and you see a lightsaber. First thing you start doing is throwing out your own spin of the movie. It's it's really yeah, crazy. Yeah. Like, I've been asking people this. is like, could it be a possibility that, that since the card game was lost, you know, Lando's going to do something a little bit smoother? And it would seem like something Lando would do. Yeah. But it would seem like something that, that Leia, you know, who's the closest to Han that she could talk to to get comfort from him just bouncing off with Chewie to go, you know, smuggle stuff. I was, oh, I thought you were going to say she was going to have a half wookie child now. Uh. <laughs> now. Now, on a previous podcast, I brought this up to a couple of friends, and they said, well, wouldn't it be a lot, wouldn't it make a lot more sense if, uh, if Luke Skywalker made it with an Ewok? I was like, no. <laughs> well, so when, you're, when you're all by yourself for a while, you know, even them little Ewoks start looking cute. 
Well, I mean, if his hand is still floating in space, he's only got one hand. So <laughs> <laughs> sometimes, you know, the Ewok makes good comfort. They're fuzzy too, but not in all the places. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that that Star Wars stuff. Oh, I'm telling you. It'll get them every time. It'll, it'll make anybody's podcast go downhill. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Uh, although, you know, I, it, it's, it's, it, you, it's, you do know that the, um, it's the Daisy Ridley character that he's talking to. No, I, I had no idea. Ray, Ray is the one who has the power. Yeah, because she's, um, she's um, um, Han and Leia's daughter. Ah. Uh. Make it more sense. Yeah. So she's the one who has the the, the power of the force. She's the um, the one who you know Finn fi- get, finds a lightsaber. They have to find Luke. They find Leia. Leia says, "Well, this is where Luke is." Leia and Ray come together for a bit. She learns about her powers of the force. Um, she sees how Luke is. You know, Luke for the moment becomes her Obi Wan. Before, <laughs> before the ultimate separation of the master and the student, and the death of the Jedi Master in the first episode, in the first chapter of any trilogy. Somebody knows a lot more than what they've been trying to. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I've watched the movie now. I don't need to see it. I'll just wait for it to come out on on video on demand. Well, it'll be out on. It'll. I'd say the movie's coming out uh, December eighteenth for Christmas. And the Blu-ray DVD will be out in May the following year. So you won't have to wait very long uh, to see it. Do you think they'll include the Star Wars Holiday Special? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny that that is, um, that is something that is kind of an artifact. that I'm so, You know, I bet you Lucasfilm has got it somewhere, and they just don't want to tell anybody. Because, you know, Lucas says he hates it. He really wasn't involved in the creation of it. Um, so he couldn't really do anything. Um, I had a story, though, um, I wanted to pitch to Marvel uh, based on the Star Wars holiday special, where it is, you know, talking about the Wookiee Life Day and all that, and, um, and then making it canon for... Um, for the Star Wars universe. Well, it's not so much out of the realm of being canon because it really doesn't do anything but celebrate a holiday. It's yeah. not like, you know, that could have happened any time, you know. And it's also the first appearance of Boba Fett, which makes it really something special that's kind of one of those things that's underground. It's like, oh, my God, it's it's Boba Fett. <laughs> All those, those animations kind of creeped me out back then. It's kind of like the old uh, Hobbit cartoons and stuff. Oh, the, ba- the, Bashki, the Bakshi stuff, the Bakshi stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, that that type of animation style always scared me as a kid. It's kind of like, ooh. Well, that was um, I remember that that um, that short was done by Nelvana Studios. It was a Canadian studio that would later do a feature film called Rock and Rule, and that is uh, actually a fun, fun movie. It's got um, sound uh, songs by Cheap Trick. Uh, Debbie Harry and um, dum 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 dum. I want to say Lou Reed. No, no, not Lou Reed. Iggy Pop. Iggy Pop doing a <laughs> bit, and it's it's some really awesome stuff. The animation is really cool, and the songs are really cool too. Um, I remember it's all out of out of that uh, Canadian studio. Just remember, folks listening at home, don't ever try to play pop culture trivia with Mister. <laughs> There's so much, so much useless information in my brain, and I can't, not, I can't even remember my own phone number. <laughs> yeah, but you probably have, you'll probably have somebody drooling over the podcast, going, "Oh, he's making so much sense. The new Force Awakens got me mind blown." They're all probably speculating right now what's going on. Oh man, did you hear what Elliot Serrano said? Let's blog it. That's something else I wanted to talk to you about, man. Like, when did you just decide I want to start blogging stuff and writing articles and stuff like that? Um, like, what got, what just turned you on to saying, "Hey, I'm going to write for this and this and this"? And it's, oh, that's a good, that's a good question. I think it started with, um, when I started my YouTube show a few years back. I met, um, I was going to Dreamland Comics. And I met a guy there named Jose Melendez. He used to be the – he was a shop clerk there. Mm-hmm. And I'd go there to buy comics, and he was just like such a personality. I was like, this dude really needs to have like a YouTube show. 
or, or a podcast or something. So I asked him if he'd be interested in doing it. And then we, um, he said, yeah, let's, um, let's do this, you know, and then we'd start, we started doing the show, and it, over time, I said, well, we need to have a blog to go with this. So I started a blog for the show. It was called, um, the show was called Comic Culture Warriors, and I called the, I, the blog was called the Comic Culture Warrior Companion Blog. And then we, I would write stuff for the blog and embed the videos, and Jose would write stuff and embed. In the meantime, I also meet um, a buddy of mine, who um, ran a, a website called uh, a Comics Waiting Room. And I'm meeting him in, um, in San Diego. He um, asked me what I'd be interested in writing. Uh, his name is Mark Mason. And he, and he asked me, you know, what I'd be interested in writing for him. And I said, sure, I'll, I'll do that. I mean, you know, I had a lot to talk about. And I thought, yeah, I, wanted to, you know, I wanted to be a writer for the longest time. And if you, you know, you got to start somewhere. So yeah. I, I wrote for him, and I just started building up this thing. So between the 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 the, the 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 YouTube show, and blogging for the show, and uh, comics waiting room, I'm just building stuff up, building stuff up, building stuff up. And then the Red Eye, the Chicago Red Eyes, one of the, the newspaper here, uh, needed a geek features writer. So I pitched myself to them, and they said, you know, okay. They looked at my all my previous work online and they said, yeah, sure. Okay. You can write for us. So I was supposed to just be doing features for them in the print, but then they said, well, you know, we're building up this blog role, this blog base. Do you want to blog for us too? And I'm like, man, everybody wants me to blog for them. <laughs> all right. So I did that and it was just, it kept going and going and going. So myself, I mean, I look at my blog as kind of like an outlet for what I want to talk about expressing myself it's in di it's different because you know like other people folks have blogs and you know i've given up on the whole trying to write something every day and have a comment on everything every day because quite frankly that you know you'll drive yourself nuts doing that exactly and uh, po folks who have like do that on their own um you know usually like the comic book websites and blogs they have more than one person writing for them it's just me and I've thought since, you know, like Geek to Me and all the stuff I've done, it's just my voice. Um, it's part of my online presence. So if I have something that I can't fit into a rant on Twitter or things that I want to show you that you won't see on my Instagram or, or on, my, on a YouTube video, then I'll blog, yeah, it's hard. I'll blog about it. It's, it's hard to blog uh, too much on Twitter. It's like, okay, you've exceeded your 130 characters. <laughs> it's like, ah, oh, and I was going to post this awesome picture, too, to go along with it. Well, yeah, you learn to just at yourself, and then you'll, it'll string it all together for you. But it is, it is kind, of, kind of rough being one of those artists that goes back and, like, you post a video on YouTube, and you're waiting to just go to sleep and wake up and have, like, a million hits. And then you, you spend a week doing that, and it's like, hey, I got 300 hits. And <laughs> you sit there every day counting each one. <laughs> like, that. That gets tedious. Oh, no, it, I know it's it does. And I'll, I'll tell you right now, and, and this is the thing. You, uh, the one thing I've learned, the things that I gave – it's funny. The things that I give the least amount of thought to – I mean I'm not saying that I do things thoughtlessly and I just throw shit up, right? Um, but the things that I don't um, obsess over as much where I go, hey, this is a good idea, and I do it and, whoop, and I throw it up there, it always seems to take off – more than the stuff that I really craft and obsess yeah. over and draft and redraft and so on and so forth. You know, because the, the internet doesn't care about how much effort you put into a blog post. It's all about timing. Like, at, yeah. for instance, um, one of the first, uh, one of the things that most recently went over for me that, that just took off and I don't understand why is um, the most recent one was I was at Star Wars Celebration. And I was by the, the cantina area that they set up in the convention center where folks who just – you could go in and hang out there if you were dressed as a Star Wars character. Oh, don't, don't tell me you had to shoot Greedo. No, I didn't shoot Greedo. <laughs> I, that would have been cool, but no, I didn't. But I got a shot. It was funny. I saw this guy who looked like – he looked like 1970s Luke Skywalker. He had the long – you know, the David Cassidy hair and whatever, and yeah. he's dressed as Luke Skywalker. And he's sitting there with um, Obi-Wan Kenobi, Han Solo – and there's a Qui-Gon Jinn at the table too, but he's not facing me. I can just see the 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 um the ponytail in the back. 
Yeah, the mystery. All right, and then Darth Maul sneaks in like on the left, on the right, and I'm. But me, the whole time, I'm just taking shots. I'm trying to get a shot of this dude who, to me, looks he's a really good Luke Skywalker. So I'm getting shot after shot after shot, and then afterwards, I go scrolling through the pictures. And I'm going, oh, that's interesting. There's Luke Skywalker sitting at the Star Wars Cantina with Han Solo, um, 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 uh, Obi Wan Kenobi, Qui Gon Jinn, and Darth Maul. You know, Darth Maul is sitting there, right? And I'm there going, and I'm the, and it wasn't even like the best photo I had, but I'm looking at it on my tablet phone. I had like a Note Four, and I'm scrolling through. I'm going, oh, this one looks pretty good. So I, I hit it, I tweet it real quick, and I put, um, I put the caption. I go, a Sith Lord walks into the 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 Mos Eisley Cantina. Dot dot dot, and then hashtag Star Wars jokes. Fine, that's like, you know, Sith Lord walks into a bar, blah, 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 right? And I throw that off like nothing. Like, I go, yeah, that takes a joke. Okay, so next thing I know, um, StarWars.com faves it and retweets it. Oh, I was, I was hoping you was going to say millions of memes happened at that point. Oh, really? Point. No, <laughs> really. <laughs> and, and, then, and then next thing you know, it, it, went, it, it took off. I'm still getting people faving and retweeting it today. This was like two weeks ago. Is, is this the point when you get a phone call that says, hey, would you like to come to the Star Wars celebration? Yeah, oh, well, I was there. Yeah. Well, that's what <laughs> – Next year? Yeah, you would think. <laughs> you would think. But, yeah, it just went – and, and I look at my phone. I go, when I look at that photo, I go, wow, it wasn't even entirely in focus because I have another photo that's even better than that. And Darth Maul's really in focus and, and Obi-Wan's facing a different direction. It looks kind of cool and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, now if I had had obsessed over it like that, Chances are I don't tweet it until, let's say, later in the day or late at night when the folks from StarWars.com don't even notice it, and then they don't even do anything with it, and then it never takes off. I can, I can see it now. You'll, you'll go to next year's celebration. They'll just tear your tickets up at the door and throw them in your face and be like, we've been warned about We've you. been warned about you. Well, it's in London, so I can't, I can't afford to go out there. So. Yeah. Yeah, that would be a tough one. I couldn't even afford to get to Chicago, man. It cost me, for a weekend in Chicago. It cost me almost two grand. Holy smack! Was, where were you staying? I was staying at the Hilton. Oh no! Don't stay at the Hilton. You gonna, yeah, their their the hotels are way cheaper than the Hilton. You know, I I didn't understand the price of a cab. I thought it was like, hey, here's five bucks, drive me down the road. It's more like here's twenty five bucks, drive me to the convention, and drive me back to the Hilton. Yeah, yeah. It's. It's rough not having a, a, a navigator. Like <laughs> I feel like if you go to Chicago, you definitely need somebody that's been there, or else you're stuck on a bus and you're going down the wrong street. And you're like, oh, it's over there. <laughs> well, the way I look at it, it's um, you know, you're gonna spend a lot of time on your feet walking. Um, that's what I did for the last C two E two, and I was constantly looking for street parking. <laughs> Yeah, I remember that you uh, you like to drive. I, I remember you leaving uh, during the Avengers thing to go get something to eat and uh, driving back. And I was like, so you drove all the way here from from wherever? Uh, where was that again? Well, the only reason I was at that it was at the uh, it was at the AMC over there yeah, somewhere. Yeah, I remember one of the AMC three. And I remember the only reason I was there too is because uh, Marcus Lashock from Channel Nine invited me. So I was like, oh, okay, yeah, I'll do I'll, I'll do it. You know, but it it pretty much become. Uh, you become pretty much the host of the thing, man. That you left an impression on us. It was just like, man, he was fun. <laughs> well, thank you. I try to be fun. I remember uh, my other co-host that was with me. He uh, he got the Hulk figure from you for answering the trivia. Gave some trivia right before the show. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They were, but it, they they needed trivia, and I was looking at the questions and I'm like, like, really? Hold on, I can come up with better stuff than this off the top of my head. <laughs> Yeah, you really rocked. The sh- it was like a rock concert, L.A. Toronto's rock concert into the Avengers. <laughs> okay. <laughs> did you get to do anything special for Age of Ultron, or did you, did you just kind of, I you know, wait for the next day and then go? I went. Yeah, I saw it last night. Actually, I just went to the theater to see it myself. I never. I didn't go to a, a, an advanced screening. I didn't go to no special event. I just went to see it with the general public. So that way, in case I didn't like it, I, didn't, I wouldn't have to feel obligated to talk nice about it. So what did you feel about it? Let's go ahead and spoil it for everybody. And if anybody has a problem with it, then you can pause the podcast, pick it up after you see the movie. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> uh, so, so what did you think going in? Because I went in there and I didn't want to have any expectations. I didn't want to say this is going to suck or this is good because I even avoided most of the trailers on the internet. Yeah. I don't know how I managed to do it, but you know, I tried not to get invested before I went to see it. Well, I, I walked away thinking it was just like the first movie, but with more stuff getting blown up. It was, it was. They pulled an Iron Man two, essentially was. They it it sold it told the same story, the exact same story. Except since you don't have to spend all this time getting them together, you can just pick up with them doing shit and blowing shit up together, and then moving forward from there and advancing <laughs> the relationships, right? But I mean, think yeah. about it. Avengers get together, have some conflict with each other. The Hulk goes bonkles. They they got to deal with him. They got to pull th- pull shit back together again, fight the villain, and then stop a machine that's going to destroy New York City. That's the first movie, right? Yeah. Same thing. Avengers two. <laughs> they get together. Conflict tears them apart. They got to get their shit together. Hulk goes bonkles. Okay. They got to deal with that. Then they got to pull their shit together so they can deal with a villain who creates a machine that's going to destroy the entire planet. Yeah, but it's a little bit different this time because a machine created a machine that created another machine that essentially saved everybody. It's <laughs> just like Terminator. Oh, there's a tw- the twist right there. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, and then, and yeah, and Joss Whedon can't. Joss Whedon can't make a fucking movie without killing somebody. He has to kill somebody. I'm like, really? That- that really, yeah, that, that, was, that was a shot to my fucking chest. Right I wasn't there. I was surprised. Like, Come I, on. I went in knowing somebody was going to die. I'm just going, okay, who's going to die? And it's like he's making it look like one character is going to die. He's yeah, like, how can I? Don't, shh, don't tell. Spoiler. I'm spoiling it. I, I gave him the opportunity to pause the podcast. Okay. <laughs> so let's go spoilerific yeah, on no. this, man. Everybody, I don't want to do that, but I'm just saying, if you put the two movies side by side, they all follow the same beats. They all do the same things. If anything, if, if I have any problem with this movie, is that Maria Hill had less to do in this movie than she did in the first movie. At least in the first movie, she gets a kick-ass fight scene. Hey, she showed up in Captain America. That that you know. that was half of her contract. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> so, I, I, so I walked out. Was I, was I disappointed? No. But was it the greatest movie ever? No. And I'm say the I, I had I'm getting a little bit. And don't get me wrong, I love the Marvel movies. I always said they got their shit together when it comes to the to the movies, not so much of the animated stuff. And the Marvel movies are way better than the DC movies. But think about it. Every Marvel movie has the same ending. Well, Heroes got to get together to stop a machine that's going to destroy the world. Guardians of the Galaxy. Heroes got to get together to stop a machine that's going to destroy the world. Thor, the Dark World. Heroes got to get together. Well, Thor's got to get his shit together to stop a machine that's going to destroy the world. Captain America, Winter Soldier. What? Captain America's got to get the shit together to, destroy, to stop all the helicarriers that are going to do what? <laughs> destroy the world. Destroy the world. Destroy the world. So, like after a while, like seriously, Let, can we come up with something new, a new ending, a, something different? Oh, and I tried to think of something different, and it made my head hurt because I was thinking back. What about the first Captain America? No, he's trying to stop a bomb from blowing up the world. Yes, <laughs> the, the, yeah. And uh, the only one uh, I was talking. Uh, the only the differences. The only differences now are the um, Iron Man movies. Where in the first Iron Man, Jeff Bridges wasn't trying to kill, destroy the world. He was just trying to kill Tony Stark. And the second Iron Man movie, they just had to stop Whiplash. Well, in each each Iron Man movie, it's Tony Hawk has to fight somebody that's built a suit out of his own armor. And then the second movie, Whiplash, didn't he build some stuff out of Tony Stark's stuff? Well, he said he had the <laughs> idea for the arc reactor, yeah. So. And then in, then the third one, he's got to fight a bunch of robots controlled by somebody else that were made by him. Pretty much. So, there you go. I get new. Got to give me something new. And then so far, all the Marvel movies, the last four or five, have all had the same ending. Well, imagine my take on it, dude. I drove ten hours to see the Avengers two weeks before it came out, and um, I'm lucky that's not the only thing I did <laughs> because I would have been really mad if I walked out of the theater like that. Because uh, whenever those Marvel people were there to film people's crowd reactions to seeing it, I really couldn't say much good about it. Like I liked it and enjoyed it, but I didn't like the screen it was playing on, and I didn't like 
I don't know. I just didn't like the way it was going. It was all Loki and Loki did this and Loki did that. And there's no Hank Pym, nothing leading up to the Avengers that I used to love, you know? Yeah. And then, of course, the other thing that annoyed me was that the theater I was in did not show the Force Awakens trailer before the movie. And apparently, oh, apparently everybody was getting to see it. I didn't get to see it. Well, they expect you to enjoy it on your, your phones. Well, they showed me that <laughs> fucking Batman versus Superman one, which is like, oh, wait, yippee, wow. Did anything even happen in that trailer? Because I watched it three times and I still haven't found anything fascinating about do, it. Do you bleed? <laughs> you will. Yeah. I have. I, if anything happened, I've been working on my Batman, my Batman voice since then. I think it's gotten much better. Where is he? <laughs> Does he bleed? Does he bleed? Will you bleed? Well, you will. You will. No. Now, you actually sounded like a uh, Grover just then. You like well, it, it, uh, yeah. <laughs> I like to think of it as clouds of white. I tend to do stupid Satchmo is what I call it. Satchmo. <laughs> Satchmo. So as far as like like being at C2E2, did you ever run into one of those, oh, God, I'm standing next to this guy, other than Stan Lee? Like, did you ever have one of those wow moments, like, this guy was in this, or, you know, fanboy moments? Um, I think Stan Lee was it. You know, I mean, last year when I got to, to do his um, – his panel and pretty much crossed that off my bucket list. Um, I thought there, there's nothing I'm ever going to be able to do to to top this. I mean, I've done, you know, I've been on stage with the Game of Thrones folks. I got to today, this year, I got to be on stage with the gal who does this, the the costumes for Agents of Shield, and she was really sweet. She's worked on the Indiana Jones movies, so that was a big nerd moment for me. Um, I mean, I don't know. There's really nothing left. I, I guess, I guess the thing now that I'm trying to focus on in my in my career is as as fun as it is to be able to you know to to geek out, to geek out and moderate <laughs> panels for people. Yeah. You know, I want it now to be where people geek out. I mean, this is going to sound really egotistical, but this is kind of like where I'm flipping flipping things for myself. Um, I, I want to be that person who's on the panel that somebody's moderating my panel that, you know, that I'm that person that people are looking at. They want to geek out with me that because I'm working on something that people are really into and enjoy and not, I, well, not just like a licensed property like army of darkness. Cause as much as I love army of darkness and, and the Bruce Campbell movies and the evil dead, I mean, that's not my property. I don't own that. I mean, it's yeah. just me playing in their sandbox. If there's any other sandbox I want to play in right now, you know, I would love to play in the Star Wars sandbox. You know, to me, um, it, it's like because the Star Wars comics were the thing that got me in the comics and Star Wars in general, really my life, uh, the, the only thing left on my bucket list right now is to write a Star Wars comic. Um, and then beyond, and, and an Indiana Jones comic. And then, bam, I can say I'm happy then, and then just do my own stuff. Do create my own characters. Do my own things, so then that people can say, "Hey, you're that guy who created that, and I really enjoy that." And you know what? I'd like to talk to you about that. And let's do a panel where we talk about that. And now, you know what? We need to find a kid who will moderate your panel, you know, and stuff like yeah. that. So then the next kid can come along and go, "Wow, that was really cool what you did. Do you want to talk about it?" And that's kind of where I am right now. It's one of those things for me, too. It's always been on my bucket list to be the, the host of my own panel. We got a year the, that we got our own panel and stuff. We had like an hour-long panel, and there was only like five people there. We still owned it, though. I mean, we still had the panel and everything, and I showed them uh, one of the new reviews that I worked on, like where I do those animated reviews. We showed uh, screened that at the Lexington Comic and Toy Convention, and uh, I, I left that panel like, man... I'm going to have to find ways of getting more people in the seats. Because <laughs> it's one thing to have a panel, but then it's another to not be able to fill the seats. Right. And I, I know, I've I been there. So I've been there. I noticed something about the, the Dynamite panel, dude. We were there for you. We was like, we're fans of Elliot, so we're going to go to his panel. Like, we pushed all the other panels aside and came to yours, and we was like, yeah, finally, Elliot's got a panel. So next time you think about, like, wanting a panel, think, I kind of already had my panel. You know, 
Oh, no, I've had them. I've had them. I, I just want to get. I just want to. I just want there to be. I'll, that's kind of like the, the the path I want to take my um my career on now though is just not so much a guy talking about things that other people create but you know being the creator. Yeah, I also want to see uh, you finally get to write that episode <laughs> for Stars. I know any other network in the world, <laughs> but <laughs> Stars maybe one day get approached to do that, man, because you've you've had a huge influence on me going back to the Evil Dead and Army of Darkness and just being able to find that geek spot man well i enjoy it you know those movies have have always been something that have um um you know kind of like entertained me to me the reason i really enjoy the army of darkness movies is because it's a horror movie where the hero wins and and i really get annoyed with horror movies where the bad guys always win where it seems like evil is something that just cannot be beaten and and friggin' Ash doesn't take that, and he fights, and he fights, and he fights. And yeah, he's an idiot, and half the time, a lot of the shit that happens to him is his own, his own fault, but he never stops fighting. So that's really the appeal to me of, of the Army of Darkness films, and of the Ash character. You know, I put Ash up there with Luke Skywalker and Indiana Jones. You know, he he resonates that much with me, and I admire the character that much. I put him up on that. I, he's the big three for me when it comes to those characters. Uh, do you ever feel like that's one series that would be awesome if they animated it? Because they could go back to younger Ash, man, and do a lot of stories and animation that they couldn't tell in, in live action. Oh, yeah. There's a, think- they, they could do some really cool stuff. The problem is, is who's going to watch it? Uh, definitely not the people that's got stars. Yeah, and then you know, and the other thing too is, well, we'll see what happens with the star series. I mean, the, the Evil Dead movies are really good, um, but it's the, the fan base for them is really it's devoted, but it's small. Yeah, I feel like they're trying to break into that uh, that AMC territory because I mean, be honest with you, nobody really watched AMC unless Walking Dead came on. Before the Walking Dead, I mean, it was like Dish Network and everything was even wanting to. To pull the network off, and then they, Evil Dead came out, and then it was like the one series to save a whole network. And then you have, um, oh, Breaking Bad, too. Can't forget that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it came out with Breaking Bad. I mean, they do a lot of good good series now, but that Walking Dead series broke them into that. Mm hmm. And now they're, now they're doing great series, so. Now, do you, do you watch any of the current series at the moment? Any of the comic series that's on TV right now? Um, let's see. Well, I've, I've stayed up on Game of Thrones. Um, uh, I'm watching Better Call Saul now because I had to. Ha- I missed Breaking Bad, and it feel it fix it meets that fix for me. <laughs> yeah. I can't stand. Um, I can't stand The Walking Dead. I've given up on that. Um, just um, it, it's too much. That's too much torture porn for me. It, it offends me both as a fan and as a as a writer. I'm telling you. I, if I were in the Walking Dead writer room, um, Scott Gimple would have kicked me out within a week. <laughs> he would have said, "Dude, you don't get it." I would have been, "No, you, you guys, you guys, you guys don't get it. You're doing this stuff just for shock value. You're doing this stuff just to get people all upset, and and that's a that's kind of a fucked up way of doing things. You know, you're bringing people into the show. I mean, let's face it." There are certain characters on that show that are never going to die, that they're not going to kill. Because the moment they kill that character, you're going to alienate a lot of fans, and it's essentially jumping the shark because no one's going to care anymore. You know, you're not going to kill Daryl on that show, pure and simple. Daryl, Daryl will live forever on that friggin' show until. A Norman Reedus says, "You know what? I've had enough of The Walking Dead. I don't want to be on this show anymore. I'm leaving." And then they'll kill him. Fifty more Boondock, yeah, Boondock Saint movies. Yeah, really, but look at that—he's made three so far, and who knows that, right? So, um, or even freaking Andy, a- Andrew Lincoln—they're not going to kill Rick, you know? He's yeah. the, the linchpin of the show. So that those guys are always going to go on forever. Every other character—it it doesn't even get enough time to really develop and grow, and you know. Pfft. So the the, the show kind of cheats, you know? It, it it's and it and it it's very unfair with the viewers. Um, so I've just stopped. I can't, I just can't watch the show, especially the last couple deaths that appeared that, that occurred on the show. I was like, you know what? This is so stupid. I can't, yeah. not watching this anymore. Um, but, um, 
it's hard to get enwrapped in uh, new characters when they don't leave the new characters around long enough to get attached to them. Or even that, it's like, it's like oh, let's kill them. Yeah, I know, but it's like, I, 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 this is the thing I always say, this is The Walking Dead. If your uncle gives you a puppy, right, mm-hmm. says, here, care for this puppy, and then he lets you care for it for like six months until you fall in love with it, and then he beats it to death with a baseball bat in front of you. Yeah, see, right? just just saying that out loud is one of those things. It's like, oh, okay. right, and then and then he goes, oh, I'm sorry. Here's another puppy, and then he gives you the puppy, and again another six months, and then what does he do? He beats you to death with a baseball bat in front of you, and then you're he's like, but that's the way life is. So you should like learn to enjoy that. Now to me, I'm like, I don't go to enter. I mean, p- people who keep going to me going, well, that's the way the world is. You know, life isn't fair, and blah 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 blah. I go, you know what? Life isn't fair, and that's why I live my life, and I watch television and entertainment so I don't have to think about that crap. You know? Yeah, you don't want to suffer. Yeah. So why why am I going to take my free time, the time that I need, like to entertain myself and forget about how crappy the world can be, and use it to watch a show that is even crappier than the world I live in? So you know, plus the show itself is incredibly nihilistic, and it has this attitude, it has this philosophy that when the end of the world comes, everyone's going to be a total asshole to each other, and the only way you can survive is by being an asshole. Quite frankly, I don't believe that. Yeah, I think a lot of people um, watch it for the opposite reason. They're like, you know, I want to watch something that makes me feel better about my life because it's so much worse than, <laughs> you know, what I have. <laughs> it's like, hey, my life sucks, but hey, I'll watch The Walking Dead. It makes me feel ba- better that there's not zombies running around killing everybody that's close to me. <laughs> wow. So people get into that. Wow. It's, it's really weird. That's a sucky cl- life. <laughs> it's really weird for the culture of The Walking Dead in Kentucky because it's where it kind of – you know, it's kind of where we, we live, and it's kind of where it circulated. So it's weird to see a television series come off that was based off being, you know, in Kentucky and some other state. So that kind of throws it off for me. I know it's it's a weird thing to say as a geek, but when you're a geek and you grow up on a comic, that's before it was ever even a, a TV show or anything, you know, sit down with Robert Kirkman because he just lives down the block from you, you know, that type of thing. Uh, it's just weird. Well, hey, more power to him for, you know, finding success and and opening that door and doing a lot of stuff. Um, Just, you know, it's just not my cup of tea. What about the others like like The Flash or Arrow or Gotham or... Um, those I need to get caught up on. I started watching Arrow and it lost me real quick because I go, this isn't Green Arrow, this is Batman. (laughs) <laughs> you know, that's exactly what what I feel too. You know, like, but I don't remember Green Arrow being all broody and stuff. I remember Green Arrow kind of like being real opinionated, and and yeah, he shoots arrows, which is stupid, but you know, it's what he does. And then then they then I found out later on they made R- Ra's al Ghul like one of his main enemies. I'm like, <laughs> he's not an Arrow enemy. He's a Batman enemy. Where's Batman? And that, that that annoys the crap out of me. Just like it annoys me that the Kingpin is Daredevil's uh, top enemy when everyone knows the Kingpin is freaking Spider-Man's enemy. Yeah. You know, that annoys the crap out of me. Um, you know, so... Is it, and then, uh, the Flash I haven't been watching because it it, you know, it it always comes, well it always comes out I'll, at night that I'm not I'm busy. I'll tell you this: just just wait for it since you haven't watched it yet. I mean, most fanboys be like, "Go ahead and watch it, Elliot. You are not ruining nothing. Don't even touch it, dude, until it comes out on like you know the entire series." That's what I recommend because I mean that's not one of those shows you're going to be able to watch with one episode. It lead off in a cliffhanger, and you not want to know what's going on because it's it follows the new Fifty Two Flash really really well Ugh. as as far as how they adapted Ugh. it. Don't mention new Fifty Two. You really didn't like the new Fifty Two. And I haven't liked anything that Marvel's been. Do- I mean, my DC's been doing new Fifty Two, old Fifty Two conversions, Final Crisis, this Crisis, that Crisis, one <laughs> reboot, another reboot. We're gonna reboot the entire universe except for Batman and Green Lantern because Batman and Green Lantern sold well, but nothing else did. So we're gonna redo everything else. How is it See, that? That's... How is it that Batman remembers everything that happened to him before, but Superman doesn't? What? See, that's that's why fanboys are always like, uh, which era of Batman? Because now it's not it's not the Silver Age and the Golden Age, you know, it's not the Bronze Age. It's more like the age of which crisis were you? Yeah, at? was it Infinite Crisis or Crisis of Infinite Earths or was it Zero Hour? Like 
that's something that, that I've been reading with the new Convergence. It takes me back to all those characters I loved and then butchers them. Uh. <laughs> it basically, basically butchers them like the old 90s Teen Titans or the old 80s Teen Titans whenever, um, you know, we had the birth of Nightwing and all that stuff. They go back to that era. Uh, they go back to the uh, back when when Batman got his back broke and then uh, Azrael or whatever its name was took over the mantle as Batman in that crazy suit. So I don't know how much how current you are with the comics lately, but this new convergence is really butchering everything. <laughs> it's, like, it's like both 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 D, again DC and Marvel are essentially doing the same thing. Secret Wars, they're going back to every friggin' event that they've ever done <clears throat> on quote unquote Battle World, which is ugh. I, that you know I'm tapping out from comics for just a little bit. I'll wait until everything's over, and then I'll pick up a trade paperback of <laughs> of collecting different stories here and there, and then I'll I'll pat, I'll tell you how I feel. But right now I, I shouldn't feel like I need to go in and buy like a hundred dollars worth of books to get a story. Oh, I agree, hundred percent. You know I've been. That's why you let let other people read them <laughs> and then be like, oh, I already know the story. I can't wait till that trade to come out. Really, I mean, if anything, what I've been doing is I've just been reading stuff on the um, Comicsology app or yeah. getting the de- different deals and yeah. getting trades as they come out. So, I just feel like the collectability of comics right now, where everybody's so into them, it's not really a market for them. So I'm like you, man. I'll I'll use the Comicsology app or I'll. Uh, I'll go to Amazon.com or something and get it for my Kindle. Because mm-hmm. I just want to read it. I don't care about what how, what they say it's worth or anything like that. I yeah. just want to read it. That's the way I am with most of the series too. So what do you got? Uh, what do you got coming up for us in the year 2015? Well, um, got a couple of things in the works. I have a creator-owned project that I'm working on with an artist right now. Probably start off on the web as a web comic, and then if we can build a readership from it, we'll put a Kickstarter together to um, put it into print. But um, we're just, you know, we want to put some ideas out there and work on that. I'm going to keep doing my own personal stuff with uh, the blogging, radio, and social media. And then, hopefully, uh, a couple other things will come down the pike and uh, some opportunities will present themselves. But I don't want to jinx it just yet. Where can the people find you on the web? Well, uh, obviously, if you want to find me, you can always just uh, Google me, Elliot Serrano, with two L's, two T's, and two R's. And you'll see my website, my Twitter, my Instagram, my web. Uh, my blog is called Geek to Me Adventures with Chicago's King of Geeks, and uh, you can find that at geektome.net. You can follow me on Twitter at Elliot Serrano, and also on Instagram um, at Elliot Serrano. I've got a Snapchat, but I'll be honest, I don't look at it. <laughs> I don't. I really two, don't. People snap. Two second clips. Yeah, it's like, and I'll like, every once in a while I'll open the app, and I, it has like, I've got like, 30 on um, you know 30 snaps that I haven't looked at I'm like <sighs> I'm not looking at it now so so don't bother, <laughs> don't bother snapchatting me um, but uh, oh I'm on Facebook too um, Facebook slash Elliot dot Serrano you can find me there if you um, right now I don't have so many um, friends that I have to start weeding people out but the rules apply. If you find me on Facebook, uh, be nice when you comment on shit. If you're just going there to troll or be snarky or argue crap, I'll just, I'll just d- delete you, unfollow you, whatever. I'm not even gonna cry about it. I'm not gonna go, oh my goodness, how could I have let them go? I'm gonna be like, go away. <laughs> but beyond that, you know, <clears throat> I try very much to, to keep an, um, keep. If you follow me online, follow me on Twitter. You'll see where I am, what I'm doing. I try very much to keep an active social media presence to at least let people know what I'm up to and, um, you know, and have fun while I'm doing it. And then, of course, as things go out, you know, as events take place around Chicago or the conventions and I'm there, um, you can always follow me there and meet me face to face. That's definitely pretty awesome. Hey, where can they find some of your podcasts? Oh goodness, that, that's the other thing too. I've been I'm kind of all over the place right now. But the I'm right now I'm doing a podcast called Geek Counter Geek. If you go to gabatron.com, um, you'll find the show there. I do a weekly podcast with um, 
my co buddy, uh, my co host Keith, Keith Conrad. I found it pretty cool, man. I pulled up iTunes and right off the bat, there yes. it is. And um, Geek Counter Geek. We've uh, we've been going for about three months now, so it's a nice little nice little short podcast you can listen to in your car or you know on the train or wherever you are. And um, then I'm doing little guest appearances here and there. I've been on yours. I've been on Rivet.com, RivetRadio.com with James Van Osdell. I'll probably be showing up there time in a little while, you know, every once in a while too. And um, also on the Patty Vasquez show. She has a, uh, if you go to WGN.com, yep. you'll find me there. Yeah, you can actually find that one on uh, iTunes too. Yeah. WGN Radio. There you go. With Patty. Dude, that's, uh, that's a lot of information to everybody to take in. <laughs> <laughs> I don't intend to make it that much. It just, just happens to me. So before we wrap up the show tonight, you got anything you want to kind of speak out about the trolls and the flamers of all these <laughs> comic book movies and, you know, going to people's blogs and trolling them? And <laughs> uh, you know, and I, I've, I've, I've had my rants on trolls. I, I will say this. If you are a troll, okay, and I speak to the trolls of who, uh, who are nine, nine out of ten, nine out of ten are going to ignore this advice. Um, but the one that is listening, my friend, I'm talking to you. Guess what? People will like you. People will respect you. And guess what? You're going to have a lot of friends and get people's attention if you stop being a dick and decide to just be a decent human being. Because guess what? Everybody loves something. Everybody has passion for something. And everyone has an opinion. You just got to learn to respect everyone. Learn to respect others, and people will respect you. Being a troll might give you a thrill, you know, being behind the cloak of anonymity, you know, picking on people because you feel that people have picked on you long enough and so on and blah, 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 all the bullshit excuses you give yourself. Okay, guess what? All of us have been picked on. I've been picked on. I've had shit sandwiches served to me, and I was never happy about it. But I didn't decide to go down the path of trollism. I decided to go down a path of being a respectful human being. So don't be a troll. And be a respectful human being, and guess what? You're going to get a lot more out of life that way. So what do you think makes a troll, like as far as, as somebody just bitching about something that's clearly wrong with the movie and then somebody that's, that's basically just giving it shit for no reason? Um, you know, uh, you see, here's the thing. I don't want to like say that a person should like everything and not voice a dissenting opinion, okay? That's not what I mean by trolling. I mean, and let's face it, and there's some people who've done really well for themselves just ripping films apart. Because there are times, and again, on my show, Comic Culture Warrior, my co-host, Jose, dude, he could rip stuff apart. But not only did he rip it apart, but it was entertaining, okay? See, I'm just... I'm the same way with my reviews, man. I, I kind of think of myself as a parody of a troll. I'm not really a troll, but I'm somebody that will voice the opinion of a troll even though he's not really trying to troll. He's trying to make it entertaining to be like, hey, that's funny. Well, let me ask you I, this. On your show, do you ever like go to female websites and call them names and harass them? <laughs> no. Okay, do you, ever, like, threaten, do you ever threaten people and say, hey, the world would be a better place if you killed yourself? No. Well, that, well, then there you go. <laughs> then, my friend, go on ahead. Be entertaining. I'm, when I think about trolling, that's the kind of trolling I'm really thinking about. And if you're a funny troll, I mean, I've had trolls like kind of like burn me pretty good. And I'll even yeah. go, okay, that was funny. Okay. And I'll, and I'll give you kudos for that if you're funny. But if you're unoriginal, you're boring, or just being mean, that's not going to work. So, I mean, again, I, I'm not saying that you have to love everything and be all lollipops and praise everything. If you want to, if you don't like something, you want to rip it apart and have fun with it. Go on ahead. I just about just be respectful of other people. That's all. I definitely agree with you there. Well, that's about all the time we have for tonight, Elliot. Would you be interested in coming back on the show sometime? Sure, be happy to. I've had a lot of fun doing this myself. All right, and if any guys listening out there, you can check us out at uh, the Comic Book Jerk Show on your Android devices. You can use the Stitcher app now, so now you can actually download that app to any mobile device and uh, search for the Comic Book Jerk Show, or you can send us an email at comicbookjerk at gmail dot com. Any final words tonight, Elliot? Uh, may the force be with you.
May the fourth be with oh, you. Oh, and Aaron? Yo. I love you. I love you too. No, you're supposed to say I know. Oh yeah, Jeez. I know. And then oh man, Jeebus. God. Let's just let's just rewind. <laughs> I'm I'm revoking your Star Wars geek card. <laughs> Yeah, it's going to be like when you go up to the door and they're like, oh, you're that Elliot guy. All right. Well, Thanks for having me on, buddy. No problem, man. And don't let your guys' George R. Binks hang low. <laughs> Good one. <laughs> From the flamers and noobs who were trolling the fans of midichlorian masterminds concocting a plan before he had an emporium of Endorian L's and he was complaining about those movie star Christian Bell and his manga mastermind returned again to reboot his new show with all his geeky friends like the difference in Wookiees and Tribbles and Kibbles and Bits the story comes together like a reductor twist from Harry Potter or maybe it's worse you might even curse the jerk for reminding you that everything's worse 